five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so it looks so we are a, a nice group, and so I welcome you very much. Thank you for being uh, uh, here at this uh, late hour in the afternoon. The topic is sparkling, the topic is promising, and uh, also is a very controversial topic as well. That's why we do have two keynote speakers and then uh, a panel that we hope will start the discussion that will follow in the next weeks and months and maybe years. So please uh, look uh, after us, after the panel and the session to continue to exchange your ideas, uh, comments uh, and uh, also <coughs> maybe proposal about the topic. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce you uh, the first uh, keynote speaker uh, today uh, that will uh, uh, bring us a viewpoint on mega constellation from one of the main actors, SpaceX. So thank you uh, for uh, your presence, Tim. Tim Hughes, uh, you will hear him in a moment, is uh, the senior vice president, global business and government affairs of SpaceX. And team leads uh, the policy, regulatory, and global business development efforts at SpaceX. Joining in 2005 as the company's first in-house counsel, team defined the SpaceX legal and government affairs function from the ground up, helping uh, to take the company from true startup uh, to one of the world's most recognizable and innovative uh, technology firms. So thank you, uh, team, to be here, and congratulations for your role. Please, floor is yours. 20 minutes, and then we will have some time for questions. Look, floor is yours. Good evening. Thanks very much for coming to uh, hear this talk today and for inviting me to the beautiful city of Rome. I've told uh, Roberto that uh, I'd be pleased to come back anytime he likes. This is uh, it's a true pleasure. Uh, I thought what I'd do today is talk a little bit about SpaceX in general uh, and focus at the beginning on our uh, mission, uh, our launch vehicles, and then the Starlink system. And the reason I'm going to talk about the launch vehicles and reusability in particular is that it's integral in, in, from our perspective uh, for any mega constellation to be successful, to have the ability to launch and reuse launch vehicles in order to control cost and control schedule and genuinely carry off something of this magnitude. So if I have the technology here, we'll start with mission. SpaceX was founded in 2002 to revolutionize space technology. Uh, the notion in 2002 was simply this, reduce the cost of access to space, and more broadly, make humanity a human, uh, make humans a, a multi-planetary species. Uh, with these modest ambitions, we have moved forward, uh, and we have uh, aimed to do just that. Uh, we started off with a line of rockets called the Falcon rocket, uh, and at the end of this conversation, uh, after we talk about Starlink, I'll talk about our newest rocket, Starship. Uh, but Starlink, which is the mega constellation that SpaceX is working on, is indeed a function of our ability to launch and reuse rockets, but also to rapidly develop new technologies such as the Starlink satellites. So to give you an overall sense of SpaceX, I thought I'd start with a video. Closing out. He 
max 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. on this video, Thank you very much. based on this video, get a sense of the scope of the ambitions that we have and, and how we're trying to grow the new space economy. Now, new space is a term that we actually don't use or like to use as much anymore, and as much as our company's been around for about 17 years now, and, and we like to think of ourselves as like integral to the fabric of the space industry at this point. So um, we continue to push the ball down the field, and you get a sense of it from that video as to where we're headed. Uh, we'll be launching astronauts for the first time in the first quarter of next year, uh, and we're working very hard on the Starship launch vehicle, which I'll give you some insight into in a, in a moment. But that vehicle fundamentally is meant for moon missions and for Mars missions. In terms of our progress over the past decade in particular, I wanted to put up this slide to give you a sense of where we've come from in 2008 through 2019. And I wanted to project this in as much as the, the Starlink constellation that we're working on is a massively ambitious project, and we're quite aware of that. Uh, but it is part of our DNA at SpaceX to do hard things and do them rapidly. Uh, and though we've had failures along the way, we've learned from those failures, and we've continued to iterate and improve. In 2008, we had the first launch of our first successful launch of our Falcon 1 launch vehicle, but that came on the heels of three failures, and we learned from those failures and moved on. We continued to pace, and by 2015, we achieved the first orbital rocket landing. Now, this notion of reusable rockets and rockets coming back, uh, first stage boosters in particular, coming back from space, was one that was thought to be a flight of fancy. Uh, many thought that it could not be done, and in fact, we had a number of failures along the way in attempting to rec recover boosters, but we stuck to it. Uh, we have now achieved booster landings, and I'll, I'll talk about the importance of that in a moment. Uh, but beyond rocket landings, we've now started to refly boosters on a regular basis. There's been fairly widespread adoption of previously flown rockets um, in a way that uh, has really changed the economics of space travel. Uh, and then we've moved on uh, added it to our Falcon 9 launch vehicle to fly the Falcon Heavy, which is the largest launch vehicle to fly since the Saturn V. Uh, and then most recently, in March of 2019, we took our Falcon 9 launch vehicle with a Dragon spacecraft on top, configured it in a way to carry human beings, and we brought it to the International Space Station and uh, successfully returned it home. This is a precursor to two missions, one of them coming up in the very near term where we will take a rocket with a capsule uh, equipped for uh, man carriage, we will lift it off and we will simulate a failure on ascent and we will pull the Dragon spacecraft off to safety. Once we move through that mission, we will be ready to carry astronauts for the first time. 
In terms of our launch vehicles themselves, it's the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy in the middle, and Starship. Falcon Heavy is derived from Falcon 9 and shares commonality of many part from Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has now flown successfully 75 times. Uh, we are within just a, a hair's breadth of matching the heritage of the Atlas vehicle, which by, by many accounts is you know, the most reliable vehicle in the world today, that and the Orion 5. Uh, the Falcon Heavy has flown three times, and we have an increasing manifest for that launch vehicle. And then Starship uh, as well uh, will be used. Starship is differentiated in as much as it has a new manner of engine, the Raptor engine, and Unlike the Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9, both the first stage and the second stage are fully reusable. And from our perspective, this is the holy grail of space transportation. If you're able to bring back the vehicle from space, both first and second stage, you can truly change the economics of launch. Just think for a moment, if you flew from New York City to Rome and you threw away your airplane at the end of every trip, you would not make that trip very often. Or if you did, it would be incredibly expensive. So we are trying to change that dynamic but the reusability element of this speaks to the uh, large-scale constellation that we're planning and in as much as with each reflight of a vehicle, we're learning more about the vehicle, we're increasing its reliability, and we're also able to control our own destiny in terms of the manner uh, and timing of launch, but also the economics of the launch themselves. So this is a grand enabler for usability for a mega constellation. So I think I spoke to this, but you get a sense there of the landing of, of the vehicle. We've now done this uh, 48 times, and we have reflown some 27 times. Uh, and each one of these launch vehicles can support up to 10 reflights. We have not yet tested that premise, but that is what the design cycle is against each rocket. As for Starlink, we're leveraging this reusability technology on the launch side, plus the heritage and experience we have rapidly developing complex systems for NASA and others to put together a constellation that means to provide high speed, low latency internet anywhere on the planet. And we are moving at a very quick clip. Uh, at core, uh, we have started to launch this constellation. We put up our first satellites in uh, 2018, we put up two. Um, once we saw that the technology was solid at core, we morphed the satellites in such a way to be able to stack as many as 60 satellites per mission onto a Falcon 9 upper stage. Uh, we launched our first 60 of these redesigned satellites earlier this year, and we had very good functionality on them. We went ahead and we launched another 60 of the satellites just a few weeks ago, and we aimed to launch another tranche, ideally before the end of this year. That would put us at a, roughly 182 satellites on orbit, which I believe makes us uh, the largest uh, private constellation in existence at that time. So the key components of our Starlink technology itself, try to break it up into bite-sized pieces, but at core there are four key elements. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, you have to have a complex, uh, compact, not complex, but compact design. Um, when we first started looking at the Starlink system, we were able to put only a few satellites in a fairing at any one time. We changed the design in such a way to put some 20, 26 in a satellite, uh, rather in a fairing, and, and deemed that in order to build a constellation of this magnitude and be able to truly offer high-speed global, uh, global service, we really needed it to change the design further to create a flat system that would best stack within uh, a fairing. And we derived this system where these satellites almost look like pancakes in the way that they're stacked. Uh, and they deploy 60 at a time from the Falcon 9, and it really lets you grow a constellation rapidly. Uh, we have phase array antennas and uh, electronically steerable beams on each satellite, and they enable precision placement of spot beams uh, where we want them on the planet to the receiving terminals that we will distribute when we offer this service. We have Krypton ion thrusters and onboard GPS. Um, these Krypton ion thrusters are actually the first time we understand that Krypton has flown on spacecraft like this. These are critical in as much as they allow us to uh, uh, phase the satellites up from where we deposit them, but also to bring back satellites down from space when we want them as well. This speaks to the idea of maintaining a safe space environment. And importantly, the satellites themselves are fully demisable. So when they come back from orbit, 
they burn up completely on reentry. And the idea here is, unlike almost any satellite system in history, they, we plan to have a constant refresh of the satellites that we are putting up. The satellite lifetime is five to seven years, but we expect the technology to continue and to evolve in such a way that we will actually want to bring satellites out of their orbit and replace them with new ones and increase the throughput and through, increase the efficiency and improve the system. We do have autonomous collision avoidance, um, and we share all of our information with the Department of Defense, and in fact, we publish it widely so that others who have uh, constellations on orbit, who have any satellites on orbit, uh, are indeed fully aware of what we're doing and working on, such that there is no uh, collision in space. Um, I think it's fair to say that no one is more concerned about a safe space environment than SpaceX, in as much as our core business is launching satellites for others in the industry. Uh, and providing services to and from the International Space Station to include carrying astronauts uh, into low Earth orbit. And so a, a space environment that is free of debris is paramount from our perspective. I'm going to show you a quick video of our first launch of the, of the tranche of 60. Uh, a very exciting day for SpaceX as we start to build out our Starlink fleet. I thought I was going to show you a video. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, lift off. Go Falcon. Go Starlink. So at core, we're moving rapidly against the 60 per 60 launch uh, cadence. We're hoping to do them every few weeks, um, and we'll build out this constellation rather. Uh, a few things to, to note. Um, I talked about the propulsive capability uh, to bring satellites out of orbit. We have also dropped our constellation altitude for the initial 1,400 satellites down to 550 kilometers, such that when we place our satellites in orbit, at a much lower altitude before they phase up to 550. If there is an issue with the uh, initial deployment, we can bring those satellites out of space rather rapidly. As they phase up to 550, we're still at a place where if there were ever a problem on orbit, they would decay and come out of orbit within one to five years. Um, so the 550 is, it has been an important element of what we're doing. And I should also note one other thing uh, before I talk about Starship, uh, and that is, uh, when we put up our first uh, tranche of satellites uh, uh, that I showed in the video, there was a reflectivity issue. Um, that is, uh, there was a brightness that, that came from the deployment that was of concern to the astronomy community. And by virtue of that, it was of concern to us. Not only were we concerned about a safe space environment, we were also concerned about reflectivity and making sure that science is done. Our company is a science-focused uh, company. Uh, and so what we've been doing is working closely with the astronomy community. Uh, and we have started to experiment with uh, darkening uh, the underside of the satellites. Uh, in fact, you will, it, on the next launch that we will have, we will have some experiments where uh, some of the, or at least one of the satellites is, is blackened on the bottom. We will continue to iterate on this until we figure out uh, the right approach, and we will absolutely, uh, and we have pledged to do this, uh, make sure that the reflectivity issue is addressed for the astronomy community. So, separate and distinct, um, from, from Starlink, uh, but as part of its future, uh, is the Starship. And I mentioned Starship in that it's a very exciting launch vehicle. It will be the largest vehicle ever to have flown. It is the vehicle that we need to carry human beings to the moon and Mars and into low Earth orbit as well, and potentially do point-to-point -point transportation. But the Starship vehicle will also greatly, greatly enable 
uh, uh, Starlink to continue to proliferate at a cost-efficient uh, clip. So what you saw there is both present and a projected future. The present is the Starhopper launch vehicle uh, out of Texas that is lifting off and doing lateral diverts. We've been practicing launch and landing with that launch vehicle now. It is a precursor to this fully reusable Starlink that you saw the video of that we're projecting out to the right that we aim to really transform the way that human beings live and work in space and will also enable Starlink to continue to proliferate at a cost-effective um, regular cadence. Um, it is, from our perspective, the holy grail of space transportation travel. It will be fully reusable, both first and second stage, and it should be coming relatively soon. So, I've been told my time is up, and I do appreciate your time and attention. Will we have time for? Absolutely. So, first of all, oh. thank you very much. Thank you. for this uh, broader overview with respect to mega constellations. So we understood the, uh, the philosophy behind your company. It is what we wanted to know. So we have time for some questions and then team will be around. So also during the panel, please consider that you can ask a question also to team. So we have a question. Yeah, if you can have a microphone. Uh, you, can, you can have mine. Very, very quickly, eh? first of all, congratulations for all the achievement that you presented to us today. Um, which is the standard customer you are aiming to, and um, where are the areas where this service will be mostly used according to your scheme? It's a great question. Uh, with respect to the, the standard customer, we're actually designing the system to go direct to end user customer. So it will be direct to the consumer customer. We will have an enterprise element to the business. Uh, we will be able to do backhaul as well and potentially maritime and aviation. So we're looking at all those markets. But the system itself is direct, designed to go direct to end user. And the way that the system works relative to the launches that we're doing is that we're launching in certain bands. Um, roughly uh, 57 degrees is the initial band. Uh, and so at... Um, at about 12 launches, we'll have sufficient coverage over North America, um, most of Western Europe, to go operational. And we'll aim to go operational next year. We have time for another question. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Valerba. Um, uh, uh, one item which has always been a, a little uh, tricky is the receiver. The receiver is a, is a costly element, after all. How do you manage that? Yes, the, the, the terminal, you're exactly right. The terminal is a hugely critical element to closing the business, in, independent of the backhaul business you might do or the aviation or maritime business. So to go direct to end user, you need to have a low cost, high throughput receiver that functions beautifully with your system. We are working very hard on that in-house. We've made great progress, and we're aiming to roll out with that next year. We're feeling quite confident of that this moment. 
so nice. We can have another question. <laughs> we cannot stop that. One more question? So Justin, I have a quick question for you. Um, you have a great policy for the disposal. So congratulations for keeping the space as clean as you can. But what about the size of the mega constellation? That is one of the parameters many people are a little bit worried about. Uh, in terms okay. of the grants? In terms of the number of uh, items you put in space. Even if you have a great disposal phase, you are putting a lot of objects in space. Sure. So do you have a, a size of the constellation that you think is a good compromise between uh, polluting the space, bracket, and uh, uh, adding the service and the internet access for everybody that is a right of humanity? So I, I would say that the size of the constellation is not the concern, it's the controllability of the constellation uh, and the demisability of the constellation. Um, so we have very strict controls on the constellation and the way it operates, not only in and of itself, but relative to other would-be constellations that are out there. Um, and so uh, those controls, rather than the sheer number of satellites, is, is what the concern should be. The goal is, is rather an important goal, of course, to be able to connect the globe and provide unserved and underserved folks with capability. Um, that is, in fact, the, the target market for what we're working on, the unserved and underserved. And in a, in a world that's increasingly connected, that is an important goal. And it, of course, must be balanced against space safety uh, and the protection of space assets. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you can remain with us, and uh, maybe more questions will come. So thank you.